So I believe um, Indeed had what we call the first mover's advantage. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, many, many years ago, there was no such thing as a job aggregation site that was pulling in jobs from every job board. It was, you know, mostly sponsored jobs. So you'd have to, you know, Microsoft would have to sponsor um, a job on a dedicated site or put it on their own site. But there was no site that was aggregating all of the jobs in the world. And that was the the initial mission of Indeed was one site, all jobs. Um, and that means all jobs. And so it was the only place that you can go um, to see you know, a truly holistic view of what jobs were available without having to take a, a very fragmented approach to the job search. And so really one of the things I think besides you know being the first person or the first organization to do this that set them apart is from day one, they put the job seeker first. Mm-hmm. Um, they made a commitment to never charge the job seeker. They made a commitment to always have what's best for the job seeker in mind when they're building the platform, when they're scaling the platform. And this is this has been a mission that has run true from day one till you know year ten to what, what will be year fifty. Um, it will always be the the center and the hallmark of the mission behind Indeed, which is putting people first. Um, and, you know, the mission is, is we help people get jobs and that um, stays true uh, in everything that we do and every product we develop. It's always with the job seeker in mind and doing right by them. And I think that has has really helped position us to be, you know, the number one job site in the world. Yeah. You know, innovation is happening everywhere. Um, and you know, the, 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 the saying innovate or die. And I think the leaders at Indeed are very cognizant of the fact that just because we're number one now doesn't mean we'll be number one tomorrow. And the only way to stay as number one and the only way to continue to grow and to scale and to add value to the community and, and continue to build the products that we do is to continuously innovate. And this day and age, the best way to innovate is to create these incubator programs um, and these innovation labs, these real life R&D labs, where we're able to test and experiment and um, build MVPs and scale and grow. Um, and I think you know, building an infrastructure that enables that is really valuable to the, the future success of the company. And, our, and we're very fortunate that our leaders have taken a very hands-on approach um, to understanding what the, the mission behind the incubator is and why we're building incubator. And I think a lot of times when I speak to innovation, um, innovation leaders like myself, I find that there's a misalignment between um, executive leadership and the incubator program, whether it's like expectations that are misaligned or whether it's, you know, they just don't have the correct buy-in or even when it comes to like attitude about failure or perception of failure. Um, and one of the things that I think Indeed has done really well um, is having executive buy-in from day one. So our, our senior leadership team are part of the decision makers and they're the investment committee and they sponsor these, these products. So every product that, that we decide to fund has an advisor on the executive committee board. And so that person will help um, advise the, the direction of the product. And so they take a very hands-on approach to what we're building. And so this not only enables an alignment, um, but it also gives our team um, opportunity to have access to the best and brightest minds of Indeed and, and create this business alignment, um, as well as this just having access to this wealth of knowledge as an executive leader. Um, and then another thing is is our approach to failure. So um, we are we don't see failure as failure. We see failure as a learning experience. And it's on us to be able to repackage that and to be able to share those experiences. So it's not as though we're just building products, shutting them down or scaling them. We're also sharing our learnings with the rest of Indeed. We're also democratizing innovation in a way that hadn't existed before the emergence of this incubator program. And that is in large part to the way that the leaders look at at what failure is. And, you know, our CEO said something that was really compelling. And he said, you know, like, the next best thing to a product getting more funding to continue to grow is the product, just the product leaders and the, the product people deciding to shut down the product, um, knowing that we're not going to throw more money at, at a problem that we can't fix or a solution that just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so being able to say like, hey, like we, we tested it, we tried it, it didn't work. Let's let's teach people, let's share this knowledge and then move on to the next is really valuable. And I think a lot of incubator programs don't have that um, same perception of, of what failure is and, and how we can repurpose that to be le- uh, like very valuable learning experiences. And in the end, that winds up saving time, money, resources um, for multiple teams throughout the organization. Mm-hmm.
we are an internal product incubator. So we yeah. don't invest in startups uh, or entrepreneurs outside of Indeed. What we build is a, what we say we cultivate a, or we foster a culture of entrepreneurship. Yeah. So we have um, something called the open pitch process. So anybody in Indeed, any role, any tenure, any office in the world can pitch their idea. We have a mechanism for, for pitching. So we do that twice a year. Mm -hmm. We have an investment committee. We have a whole process and program around it. And so that's our way of um, being able to generate new ideas. And if those ideas get funded, then those people get to temporarily come on to the Indeed um, incubator team. We provide them with resources. We provide them with an entire team of engineers and, and product designers and um, UX designers and, and product managers. Um, to be able to test out their idea and build out their MVP for a, a set amount of time. And so that's the way that we essentially are structured is mm -hmm. through this open pitch process. And then in addition, we have dedicated um, product managers on our team. Mm -hmm. And then they'll also pitch product ideas to executive leadership. And then that's also how we get more product ideas as well. So the infrastructure is the same in terms of we have something called the metered funding model where each um, project gets funded for a set amount of time with a set amount of resources that we provide. And that's the same regardless of the project, mm -hmm. um, just so we can, you know, create, you know, like a, a very strong structure around it and that's scalable or not. And, you know, we, we focus on building the MVP. Um, so we have like this nail it and scale it mentality. Yeah. Um, in terms of the types of projects, uh, we're really fortunate that, we, well, one of the, the things that we require is that anybody pitching an idea, it's not a feature. It's an entirely new standalone product. So it has to be outside of the bounds of what we've already built. So that creates this, this mechanism for um, funding new product ideas. So it's not like this is a feature. This is something we can add to something that exists. It's like, no, this is a completely different product that we can um, build and scale and, and potentially become a core product offering at Indeed. Mm -hmm. um, and the interesting thing about, you know, having these ideas come from all over Indeed is you have people in different markets um, that have access and exposure to, to different market um, behaviors. You have people from different organizations. So you have like, we have a lot of people that come from the CS org or the sales org who are, you know, in the front lines of dealing with customers and clients and see the problems. And they're the ones who are, you know, building these solutions. Um, we have people from the engineering org. So it's just, it's just this very multifaceted, um, multidisciplinary um, way of um, creating new product ideas mm -hmm. because they're coming from all different parts of the organization. So we, we, we generally stay within like the HR tech job board space. I mean, like for us to be investing in like robotics, like that's not yeah, the, yeah. Be the best use of like our time or our resources. <laughs> you know, we want to we want to be able to invest in things that we know will um, move the dial in, in the space that we're in and, and focus on the vertical that, that we are in. So I'd say we, we'd say we, we stay pretty adjacent. Like there are some wild um, products that come from Indeed that, that, you know, might be, you know, significantly different than our core offerings, but they do still fall under, you know, this Indeed ecosystem of, of job boards and helping job seekers find jobs. Sure. So, of course, there are, you know, there are some challenges when you're dealing with a multi-billion dollar company that has hundreds of millions of users on their site. So we can't just go rogue all the time. Um, you know, that being said, we, we were, we were created to kind of operate on our own Island. And so I think we get a lot of leeway. We got a lot of rope when it comes to um, building and testing things because we are, we, um, you know, create a, a, a a distinction between the core business and the incubator program. So we do have like our own operating guidelines. We do kind of operate, like we, we kind of dance to, to our own beat. Um, uh, and so, you know, there is a lot of, um, a lot of leeway that we have in order to be, you know, this innovation arm, because if, if we were beholden to the same rules um, and structures as the core teams, and we wouldn't be able to operate in the velocity that we operate. We wouldn't be able to take the risks that we take. We wouldn't be able to make the bets that we make. 
Um, so I think it's a really, we're, we're in a very good position because it's like we have the best of both worlds. We have the resources and um, the, the, the tools that come with a large scale corporation, but we also have like the operating procedure and the philosophy of more of a startup type um, environment. Very good. There's a quantitative measures and there's qualitative measures of success. Um, for the quantitative measures, it's pretty simple to measure success for us. It's what products were acquired. Um, so, you know, when we look at the, the product life cycle of an incubator product, um, in the end, it either continues to ask for more funding and grow, um, but at a certain point, we have to stop asking for funding. And the, you know, the goal is to either shut down the project um, because we've learned as much as we could, or, um, what true success would be is it gets acquired by a core group. And that means that, you know, one of our mature orgs um, likes the product, wants to um, absorb it into their product offering or into their um, group, whether it's SMB or enterprise or the job seeker organization. Um, and then they will essentially acquire that product, sometimes with the team, sometimes just the product. And we pass it along and ensure that the, you know, the, um, the, the tech stack stays the same and, and the transition is uh, works on, you know, on the engineering and product side. Yeah. Um, so that's one measurement of success for us. Uh, another measurement is uh, we have a lot of events. So I had mentioned, you know, when products shut down or they get acquired, we host something called the Learning Initiative. That's a really big program that we've created um, as a way to democratize innovation, um, as a way to teach other groups that don't necessarily have access to the incubator on lean startup principles and, um, you know, startup methodologies and innovation methodologies. And so that's another measurement of success, success. It's how many people are we impacting? How many people now have access to this information or this knowledge that they didn't have before? And then on a, on a qualitative um, measurement, it's, um, you know, are we building a culture of entrepreneurship? Are we enabling people to think outside of the box? Are we um, creating um, an environment of, of diversity, inclusion, and belonging? And so how do we do that through, um, you know, through different programs, through different initiatives? Um, through working with other teams like the ESG group or the DIMB group. Um, and so, you know, for us, success is, you know, of course, it's like how the products do. Um, that's, you know, in the quantitative way, but in the qualitative way, it's how the people do. Um, what have we done that we've built that have either changed the lives or impacted people, whether it's in Indeed or outside of Indeed? And how have we created this culture of entrepreneurship and enable people to bring innovation into their individual roles um, without having to necessarily participate in the incubator. I think the ideal, and, and also I have to say, I'm a little biased. I come from the startup space. I come from the, the entrepreneurial space. Um, I'm not this is my first corporate job, so uh, I haven't you know, been, been drinking the, the corporate tea for too long, but I'd say the, the most effective innovation program or incubator program would probably be a hybrid. Um, and and that some, in some companies that exist, some, some yeah. doesn't. And when I say hybrid, I mean both an internal um, incubator, like what Indeed does and what other companies do, but also have an arm to invest in external companies mm -hmm. because innovation is happening everywhere. And so if you're only building in-house, you will create this echo chamber of ideas. Um, and so... Being able to, you know, build in-house and have this internal incubator, I think, is really valuable because you have the people who understand the product, you have the people who understand the mission and the vision and the business objectives, you have the resources. But also, I think if you were to inc incorporate some sort of a, a startup accelerator model within that, um, where you're investing in startups with adjacent technologies or complementary technologies, um, or startups that can just add to your portfolio, I think, could be really valuable. And that could be either a path to M&A, it could be partnerships. Um, it could be just, you know, just regular like CVC investing. Um, but I think having that hybrid model of internal house, like internal building um, and then external investing is probably the most advantageous for um, the next generation of, of corporate incubation and, and innovation. I think, um, you know, that's not an easy question or an easy answer, but I think it has to do a lot with 
aligning goals and expectations and understanding that we're all working mission and behind the same vision. Mm -hmm. And I think it's finding people who are comfortable being uncomfortable because, you know, like it, to work in an incubator, it's every day is different. Um, you know, projects are constantly shutting down or ramping up. There's no rhyme or reason. We can't, we have no visibility into the future of a product. Whereas like, if you are an engineer on a core product, you know, you're going to keep on writing code and it's going to keep on, it's the same thing. Um, maybe there'll be enhancements, maybe there'll be feature changes, but from one day to the next, you're not going to shut down the entire product. Um, whereas an indeed, oh, sorry, an incubator, um, we do do that. So I think it's about finding the right people who are, who, who align with the vision and the mission and are okay with the experimentation, who, who do value disruption and um, understand the impact that comes from this, because, you know, it, it can be a really difficult for people. Like you spend a year writing code and then from one day to the next it's scrapped or you spend, you know, a year building a marketing campaign and then the project shuts down and you have to start from scratch from the next product. And it, yeah. it can be difficult for a lot of people, but I think it's finding the, the people who value um, the constant change and, and um, right. you know, those who want to keep on moving forward and keep pushing the bounds of what's possible as it relates to, to innovation and understanding that those are the kinds of people that you want building the product. And, and, and that's also why it's really difficult for us in terms sometimes to recruit or to hire Mm -hmm. In Indeed, um, sorry, not in Indeed, an incubator. Yep. Because it takes a certain kind of person. You need to have this like tenacity. You need to have this this sense of disruption. You need to have this open mindedness, and you need to have this lean startup methodology yep. um, built into to how you operate. And um, that is a lot rarer to find in a corporate setting than it is in, let's say, like a startup setting. In order for us to be successful, we need to work with external teams, um, yeah. you know, other groups at, it, at Indeed. Um, you know, so our team incubator, the way that we're structured is we are a multidisciplinary team. Um, so our leadership team is made up of <clears throat> a bunch of, of different functional leaders. So we have program, product, engineering, marketing, UX, sales, and legal. Yeah. And so, um, and that is the core to like our team. So we have about a hundred employees um, across three locations globally. And so those people are core indeed incubator employees. So regardless which project shut down or start, we all are involved. in incubator. Um, that being said, in order for our products to scale and to succeed and to get acquired, um, we need to be working with other groups outside of incubator on a regular basis. Um, you know, if a product is focused on job seekers, we need to go to the job seeker org. If a product is focused on you know, small and medium sized businesses, we go to the SMB org and we work with different people. Um, you know, a lot of times like the program groups will work together on a certain campaign or the marketing teams. So, um, you know, we are, the way that we're built is we are autonomous to, to an extent, but in order for us to be successful, in order for our products to be successful, we need to work with core groups at Indeed um, to ensure that there's alignment and, um, you know, just also to get more data because, you know, we're, we're, we're building these products from scratch, whereas we have um, legacy products and they have a lot more data than we do on similar or adjacent topics. And for, it would be very valuable for us to, to have access to that. And the only way to do that is to continuously collaborate and talk to those groups. Okay. I'd say the way that we approach leadership is probably the most important thing. Um, having this alignment with executive leadership and this buy-in with executive leadership is probably like the most fundamental um, element to a successful incubator because once that doesn't exist, I mean, you can change things structurally. You can change, you know, whether it's metered funding or like indefinite funding, you know, that, that stuff can change. You can tweak, it can, you can iterate. But if you don't have that executive leadership buy-in, um, then it's really difficult for the program to succeed. So I'd say, you know, one of the things that we did really well that I would absolutely take to my future, um, if there were, you know, other other teams or other groups or other companies, is having building this alignment from day one with executive leadership and understanding that they are a part of the decision. Um, they have this buy-in, what like aligning what our expectations on failure is, um, defining what that looks. Um, you know, a hands-on approach to the development of the product as advisors or um, influencers in, in what gets built. 
So I'd say executive leadership is is number one. Um, another thing is um, I think the learning initiative was really valuable. So mm -hmm. that's something that I launched, um, and I came in about two years after the, the program launched. So we were at you know the the early like the nascent days of incubator. So I came in, you know, they started building the infrastructure. I came in to scale it. Um, and so one of the things that I implemented was this learning initiative, and I think that's something that a lot of companies miss out on. And, and one thing we have to realize is as an innovation lab or as an R&D lab, you're exposed to a plethora of learnings, of experiments, of things, you know, that, that the rest of the company just will never have access to just based on how you're built and what you're building and, and, and how you operate. Um, and so being able to share that with the rest of the, the company and being able to document your learnings um, and, and spread the learnings um, across multiple organizations, across multiple teams and multiple people, I mm -hmm. think is incredibly impactful and valuable. Um, and it also helps democratize innovation and have give, give people access to the things that we're doing and, and what we're learning. And then that can, the, the possibilities are endless in terms of how to measure impact from something like a learning initiative. And I think mm -hmm. that that's incredibly valuable um, when building out these types of innovation programs. So whenever we have a new hire, uh, we send them the this book, Nail It and Scale It. Okay. That's uh, one of our like um, famous books that, oh, that we, we tell everybody to read. Yeah. Um, for me personally, one of my favorite books of all time is um, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, I, think that I can love be, that one. Yeah. I love that. It's Good. like one of my favorite books. I think that's valuable for anybody in any area of um yeah. you know, whichever career they're in or like corporate form. or startup yeah i think yeah. It's, it's one of my favorites but yeah. yeah nail it and scale it is like our incubator go-to welcome to incubator read this book i like how i built this um it's like a, a startup podcast so it it, it, it talks it's about, you know, it's, it, it uh, interviews entrepreneurs of companies that you probably know of, and it tells the story of how they built their company to be what it became. And it's just really interesting to understand the background behind, um, you know, these companies that, that we're so familiar with and, and how it came to fruition and, and how they were able to scale. Yeah, there's one... So most of the stuff we do is um, not public uh, until it's out of beta. And so one of the products um, that I can talk about, which happens to be the one I'm most proud of, is um, something called hiring events. Mm -hmm. And um, this was a product that graduated from Incubator. It was acquired by our enterprise team. And now they have a dedicated team focused on hiring events. And so essentially what hiring events is, is, is dedicated job fairs for individual companies. So let's say Amazon is like, I want to hire... 50,000 warehouse employees, you know, there's a lot of work in the back end that goes into hiring, you know, whether it's, um, you know, screening candidates, receiving um, resumes, scheduling interviews, interview, you know, there's just a lot that goes on the back end. So for, for something at that volume, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and so what we've done was we created a product that rather than apply to a job, you're RSVPing to an event. Mm -hmm. um, and then that event would happen, you know, the, that would be run on the, on the client side. So let's say, you know, uh, Amazon is hiring, you know, 50,000 warehouse employees in Denver, they mm -hmm. would rent out, you know, a convention space, or they, they'd have it at their office, depending on the size. And so um, we would then promote it like an event, and then people would show up with their resumes, and then they would have interviews on, on site on, mm -hmm. on the spot. Um, mm -hmm. So it would take away all of that friction and challenging of scheduling and screening and um, organizing um, and interviewing. And so a lot of times people would just leave with a job on the spot. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, that was cre created immense value, uh, not only for, for the client, but also for the job seeker. They're now, you know, going to an event, walking out and they have a job. Um, and so, you know, this is obviously like impactful in many ways. We, we've created um, hundreds of thousands of jobs through this, if not possibly millions of jobs through this product. Um, but it's also it's also nearing the hundred million dollar um, revenue stage at this point. So that's that was a brainchild from an employee at Indeed Very that cool. we brought to Incubator, and um, now it's become its own core product. And that was about three. It's it's about a three year old, three to four year old project. Um, 
so just in such a short amount of time, it was able to, to you know, just massively scale. It's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, no, I think you've covered everything. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. You were fantastic. Thank you so much Thank for you. taking the time to speak with us. Um,